Well, one more time. Good morning, everyone. Good to be with you this morning. Today we're going to do something a little bit uh, different during our service time. Those of you who are on our text message system will know that I advertise that we're going to be playing some videos this morning. We uh, started off a number of months back, man, might might have even been a year back by now, it could be more than a year back from now, I don't know, but uh, we started off some time back by um, inviting our young people to produce some videos. Isn't that right, Emily and Chris? Where's Chris? I can't see Chris. There's Chris right behind Emily. And um, everyone, of course, started off super excited about this. We gave them some rules and guidelines. It was going to be a film competition. Uh, We were expecting hundreds of submissions. We got three. (laughs) Emily and Chris, they submitted one each, and uh, Daniela submitted one. And uh, originally, as I say, it was going to be a competition. Now, this film competition was designed for those of you that are are visiting with us today, who are new to our congregation. Uh, Originally, the idea was to encourage the use of technology, the use of modern technology, digital technology, to to promote the gospel. And so the, 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 the theme of these movies had to be something of a biblical, spiritual nature. It could have been a personal story. It could be a text that spoke to them in some way. It could be, uh, it could be a drama. It could have been anything, right? And so um, I'm going to play those for you in a little while. Um, so we ended up with three. And because we had set it up as a competition, we had planned to give out some prizes. And um, the idea was that there would be a singles category and there would be a doubles category and whoever won each of those categories, so there were going to be three prizes. But seeing as how we only had three submissions, we decided to scrap the whole competition thing. We were planning to give out three prizes anyway, so we decided we would give those three to the three who submitted. So for those of you that chickened out, you lost out big time. You lost out big time. Unfortunately, Daniela is not with us today. She's in Colombia, South America, so we've only got Chris and Emily, but I will play all three of uh, those videos in a moment. Matthew, Matthew chapter 24 has this verse. It's a well-known verse. It comes in that passage kind of halfway, a little bit before halfway, maybe a third of the way through chapter 24, where Jesus is talking about the signs of the end of time. And you know what he says, wars and rumors of wars, famines, pestilences, droughts, etc. He says all these things are just the beginning. These are not the quintessential signs of the end. Those things have been with us forever and they will be with us to the very end. They are not the big deal signs, although we expect the frequency and intensity to increase as we get closer to the end, as the planet gets older, as it starts to fall apart more and more. And he goes through a few more things and he comes to this verse in Matthew 24 verse 14 where he says... And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in in the whole world for a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. I want you to notice here that the quintessential sign of the time, if you want to know where we are in the stream of history, then ask yourself, is the gospel going to the entire world? How much of the world still needs to be reached? Now, of course, that is a tricky question to actually answer definitively. Because we know that much of the world is privileged with freedom of religion, and in those areas, the gospel certainly has gone to much of the world. But then, in some of those parts of the world that we would regard as having having had a Christian heritage, perhaps even a Protestant Christian heritage, we also know that things have gone backwards some, and some of those spaces are actually almost like unentered areas, whereas they were Protestant strongholds in the ages gone by. And then we have an entire 1040 window, based on the longitude and latitude, 1040 window, the Middle East area, North Africa, the Middle East, where, we, where the gospel is very hard going, where persecution is still a major factor, especially if, if you happen to be Christian. You're not allowed to share the gospel, and so it may look like the gospel is not going into those areas, but we know that just in the Seventh-day Adventist church alone, let alone any other Christian denominations, we know that the gospel is going to those parts of the world through radio, which transcends boundaries, broadcast, which transcends boundaries. We know as a Seventh-day Adventist church that we have church plants in some of those countries, and you will not find them on any of our official listings or statistics, because, in order, because if we did that, we'd be placing our believers in that area in danger, underground church cell groups. We know that the gospel is going to the world. 
And we know that potentially, with the outpouring of the Spirit on top of everything that's happening in the world today by way of the preaching of the gospel, the signs of things that are happening, we know that the gospel can fulfill its goal, its objective, its purpose in a very short space of time, potentially. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. One of the powerful things about technology and the use of the spread of the gospel today is that you can be here in New Zealand, you can be in your house, and you can be broadcasting to the world without getting on an airplane, without contributing to the carbon problem of the world. Well, mind you, there is a battery in this phone and it was produced on a factory, factory line, wasn't it? But you can broadcast to the world from the comfort of your own home. You can develop a following of people who are interested in what you have to say about the kingdom of God for the gospel's sake. You can do those things with this device that you are holding in your hand. We know, of course, that technology can be used and abused, and we see that every day of our lives. But we also know the incredible, powerful good. Do you know that the use of technology for the spread of the gospel is actually a very Protestant idea? It was in the late Middle Ages when the printing press came to the Western world and the Bible was first printed. Now, we don't think of the written page much by way of technology, right? I mean, that is so old school. That was before technology. But actually, the printing press in the late Middle Ages was a major technological Development. I mean, it was like the invention of the wheel. Again, who thinks of the wheel as technology? It's just a given, right? But once there wasn't a wheel, and then there was a wheel, and it radically changed things. Once there wasn't a printing press, and then there was a printing press, and suddenly the Bible could be given to people in their own language. Suddenly, what used to take months or years to copy by hand became available in a very short amount of time. And the word of God could be circulated. Now we know that the printing press can be and is today abused. Nevertheless, it can be a hand, a tool in the hand of the kingdom of God or the the agent of the kingdom of God. I want to suggest to you that your social media platform, your 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 um, Facebook, your Instagram, the telephone in your hand, your video camera, whatever it might be, is like the printing press. It is simply the modern version of the printing press, and it needs to be leveraged for the kingdom of God. Instead of it just being to show your baby pictures to your family on the other side of the world, which, by the way, is a legitimate purpose, what about if it was leveraged for the kingdom of God? What if you recognized that everything you published was the same as you walking down the street, speaking to individuals one by one? It is your voice. It is the influence of your convictions. It is the sharing of the gospel. It is one avenue by means of which this gospel shall be preached to the entire world. We live in a momentous time. And that is why we have tried to inspire our kids to take these devices and use them for the glory of God. So having said that, I will show you the first video. Chris, you're going to be up first. Play it, please, uh, team at the back there. School, the most bland, boring, and tiring place to be. So despite my strong opinion about school, I always had something to look forward to every time I was stuck in class, completing studies and tests. That was interval and lunchtime. During my intermediate years at school, many of my peers were either one of the following, sitting in the breezy shade, reading a book, or huddling in a circular group, gossiping about the latest drama, or running around the playground, enjoying the warm, bright sunlight. Now there was this popular game at the time called Blind Man's Bluff, where the person who was it or tug was blindfolded, spun around several times, then that person was to tag the other participating players. The opponents are to give clues to where their location was by giving the person a tap or a poke. The thrill of how you evade and slipped past 
the other person without them noticing really made the game fun. But there was a twist. We played this game on top of a rock wall located in the playground. The platform at the top of the rock wall was small, narrow, and had railing on two of the long sides, but on the other two sides, there was no railing. A sheer drop. This time, I was the one who was tug, so I was trying to tag any other player who dared to come across me. Unaware, I was very close to the edge, and I heard someone in front of me. I leapt towards the sound, but to my dismay, the ground beneath me was not there. Unconsciously, my hand grabbed the railing, and I dangled there, shocked of what just happened. I started crying, hopped down from the ledge, and I have never played Blind Man's Bluff ever again to this day. In that experience, I thought of how my hand grabbing the railing without thought was a mere coincidence or was good luck, but I later realised that this was not possible and something supernatural must have intervened. In Psalm 91 verse 11 it says, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. I believe my guardian angel guided my hand to the rail and thus helped me in my time of need. I'm sure many of you have had similar experiences where you were in immediate danger and by some miraculous means you were saved. For instance, you go out onto the road to cross it when you're busy or distracted, only to be met by a car whizzing past you only inches away from the tip of your nose. So instead of saying, that was lucky, say, God thank you for saving me. Thank you for that, Chris. Did you enjoy that? The idea that the, the hand of God watches over us, doesn't it? And just because he's inv invisible and just because he chooses to remain anonymous in many cases doesn't mean that he hasn't intervened for our blessing and for our safety. So thank you for that, Chris. And uh, you saw a number of famous actors in that uh, production there as well. <clears throat> They'll be signing autographs after church in the back here. Jesus, uh, at his um, ascension, gathered the disciples around him. You know how the story goes. And then he spoke these words. He says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." The task that the Lord has assigned to us is no small task. And, and the Lord does that deliberately and on purpose. I think it's designed to humble us. It's designed to dwarf us in the face of the magnitude of the task so that we would never dare to either try it in our own strength nor in whatever successes we have claim the glory and the victory. The task is way beyond any individual. It's way beyond a congregation. It's way beyond a worldwide movement, even the worldwide movement called the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's even way beyond the worldwide movement of Christianity in general. The task that we've been handed uh, by Christ to disciple the world. You see, this isn't just telling people once and walking away. It is inviting them into a day-by-day -day walk with him. It is putting our footsteps in his footsteps, whether it's on the mountain high, on the valley low, whether it's on the victory plain or on the battlefield. It is walking in his footsteps day by day. It's called discipleship. It's being fashioned and formed in thought, in attitude, in heart, like the master. So often we fail, I think, because we think to ourselves, well, I've told them about the Sabbath. I had a brief conversation with someone about the gospel. I've told them who Jesus is. That is not the gospel commission. It is a part of the gospel commission, to be sure. But it is not the entirety of the gospel commission. Go make disciples. That is a calling to do life with people. It's more than shouting the truth at someone. It's more than bashing them on the head with a Bible. It's more than explaining doctrine to them. Make disciples of all nations. 
Teach them to walk with Him, to commune with Him, to talk with Him, to enter into relationship with Him. This is the challenge that has been given to the church. It is one human being coming alongside another human being and introducing them to Jesus. As you walk hand in hand with God, arm around arm with God, so too you join others to the same experience. It's a task much bigger than just explaining 28 fundamental beliefs of Scripture or proclaiming the three angels' message in a preached meeting. It is doing life together with others with a view to the glory of God, teaching them to walk and talk through the dangers of life, teaching them to walk and talk with Jesus through those dangers of life. So go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The next video by Daniela uh, talks about life and death. When you walk through nature anywhere in the world, you see God's fingerprints everywhere you look. Through the green leaves, beautiful flowers to the grains of sand at the beach. But at the same time, it doesn't take a scientist to see that it's all slowly dying. When you walk through a forest, can you see the dead leaves all over the ground and the flowers losing their colour because they're dying? It's the same in our daily lives. We have people close to us who get sick, hurt, or even die. Why do things die? Well, just like we can't see sickness or even the wind, we can't always see what Jesus is doing for us in our spiritual lives either. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Somewhere, Jesus is fighting for us. He is in a great battle with Satan who started all the sickness, hurt and death. Jesus says, no one shall come to the Father except through me. So next time you walk through a forest or even on the beach, remember, God loves you and he will come back for you. He will end all our suffering. The reason we call it the gospel is because the world is dying, but life has been offered. It is the good news that despite the wages of sin, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. In Revelation chapter 14, we hear echoes of the gospel commission in the first angel's message or the lead up to the proclamation of the first angel's message. It says in verse six of chapter 14, I saw another angel flying in, the mid, in mid heaven having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. 
That is very similar to the language that Jesus employed when he gave the gospel commission to that group on the mountainside. Didn't he say to them, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, teach them to observe all things, baptize them. Very similar language. And we know that the first angel's message speaks to a time such as this. It's in the context of revelation and an end time message. And it's like God is tapping his people on the shoulder at the end, like he did with Jesus at the ascension, at the beginning of the church's history, at the beginning of the church age. He said, go into all the world. And then at the end, as if to say, in case you've forgotten, in case it's taken a little too long, Let me just remind you of the grand task that you have before you. Every nation, every people, every language, go and proclaim the everlasting gospel. We know that what follows in the three angels' messages is nothing other than the very original message. The very same gospel that Jesus himself lived, bled, died, resurrected to give us life. It's the same eternal gospel except customized to the struggles of the last days. Customized to the particular areas of failure in the world today. The unique way in which the gospel speaks to this time and to this age. That's what the three angels' messages are about. They're not a, they're not a unique message. It's the same everlasting gospel. They simply have a unique customization and application to a particular time and a particular place. You and I live in that time and we live in that place We are the messengers of the three angels. In fact, if you look at the Greek, you know that the word angel is actually not the word angel as we think of it as a, you know, a supernatural divine creature of some origin, you know, Gabriel or some archangel. The actual word in the Greek is simply messenger. It's the three messengers message. You are those messengers. You are the first angel. You are the second angel. You are the third angel at a time like this for this time in history, for this world. You and I are invited by God to use our influence, our words, our presence, our example, our technology for the kingdom of God. So the question is, what are we doing? What are we doing? The third video is about light and dark and stumbling around in the dark. We've all had that experience. It's produced by Emily. Have you ever tried to walk in the dark before? Maybe you got out of bed in the middle of the night to use the bathroom and stubbed your toe on the edge of the bed. Or maybe you even tripped over your cat and banged your knee on the dresser. Walking in pitch black darkness is pretty scary because you have absolutely no clue where you are going. I had an experience like this once when I was younger, but the result was much more severe than these. It all started when I was a year five. I went to a school camp in Russell. One night we decided to play spotlight with the whole class, which is a game where there is someone holding a bright torch in the middle of a field, and they are trying to find people while everyone runs away from it in the pitch black darkness of the night. So, I saw the light was slowly coming towards me, and I ran the other direction as fast as I could. But, my luck, a guy was doing the exact same thing, but towards me. And it basically ended with us crashing faces, me having a few second concussion on the floor, and the result was this. So, walking in the dark isn't that fun, but here is God's promise. When you go through difficult seasons in your life, He will not leave you. You don't have to be afraid. It's true, you may not be able to see where you are going, or where your life will lead you, what job you will get, or who you will marry. But... If you hold tight onto God's hand, you can be sure he can see what's ahead. He has amazing night vision and knows how to keep you safe and secure. He will guide you back to the light. You just have to trust him. Just trust him. enjoyed the videos. 
I love the talent, I love the creativity, I love the thinking outside of the box, I love the artistic flair, all employed for the kingdom of God. And you know, this is one of the key ideas behind this whole thing is, I guess when you are involved in church, we have, we have certain roles, we have certain official ministries, we have certain particular skill sets that are very easily leveraged in the church. But I fear that for too long, we have neglected the creative side. For too long, the artists among us, the creatives amongst, amongst us, have not always had a very prominent place in the proclamation of the gospel in a church context. That needs to end. That creativity is a God-given gift. And like any other ability, whether it's the ability to speak, whether it's the ability to play music, whatever it is, the ability to teach, you think of the, you think of the spiritual gifts in the New Testament, whatever it is, creativity is one of God's most powerful gifts for the proclamation of the gospel. So, if you are a creative person, do not let the stymieing influence of traditional church stop you from leveraging that special gift for the kingdom of God. What can you create for God? What can you create that communicates the gospel in some way, visually, that engages the senses of hearing or even touch? We are creatures of the senses. But I would say that as a church, typically, the sense that we perhaps most capitalize on to communicate the gospel is simply this one, the hearing sense. I think there are a bunch of other senses besides that that we need to leverage for the kingdom of God. So what would it look like? You have unique gifts, unique talents, unique creativity. You may not be a sculptor or you may not be a painter or you may not be a digital artist. You may not be a filmmaker. You may be one of those things. What can you do to leverage your passion, your skill, your ability for the kingdom of God? You know, when we got hold of these young people, we didn't give them a whole lot of direction. We said, here are the rules to the competition. You have to film it yourself. It can't be filmed by your parents or by somebody else. Use your mates, get them to chip in and help you. You need to film it, you need to edit it. But you know what we didn't do? We didn't sit down with them and train them to do it. Now I know that's actually really bad practice from a leadership perspective. But this, this effort you've seen here this morning is our kids simply being unleashed to be creative. Go do it, go figure it out. And they did. And guys, I hope we'll see a lot more from you in the not too distant future. Even those who were maybe a little too chicken this time to get involved. Hey, Mutsa. So I wanna ask uh, Emily and uh, Chris just to come to the front quickly. As promised, and um, here's the part where I extol um, the virtue of procrastination. Because we took so long to finally get these gifts to you, this company just released the very latest version of their stabilizing gimbal. Now, for you, those of you that don't know what that is, it's a thing called an Osmo. You get other brands doing other things. But you know how when you hold your camera, you get that shake? This enables you, you simply place your little phone camera in there, and you can jump up and down, run up and down the street, just keeps it nice and silky smooth. So, because we took so long to finally get to this, you get the very latest edition, less than a month old, in behalf of the church, for the sake of promoting and encouraging your ongoing creative production. Thank you. So thank you for that, guys. We really appreciate your contribution. Thank you. So you've heard three messages, four messages, one message from me, three messages from our young people this morning. God in his providence looks after us, even when we don't give him the credit and we call it luck. God is involved in our daily lives. Whether in the midst of life or death, we are encouraged to look beyond our circumstances, beyond the physicality of life, and recognize that there is the God of the resurrection who promised us, who has promised us, eternity beyond. And in the midst of darkness, when you're trying to feel your way along, 
Turn to God and rely on him who is the light of the world. These simple messages conveyed in creative ways, posted to social media accounts or broadcast or, or, or emailed to somebody, can be a source of encouragement, a reminder of the gospel. It often bypasses the prejudice that people have when they see a preacher like me coming at them with the Bible. It's telling a story, a testimony, a creative production that gets people thinking. You know, in the Middle Ages, there was a time when it was, of course, illegal to preach the gospel. The state church would not allow it. And in one particular country, you know what they did? They got the children to go out onto the streets and mime, enact the gospel. They enacted the meek and the lowly Jesus on the road of crucifixion. And then they enacted the pomp and the pride of the pontiff. And the people on the street could see the difference between the Jesus and the so-called church leader. This was the use of the creative arts in a time when the traditional means of preaching the gospel was not permitted, but by the pains of death and persecution. In this day and age, I ask you, what creative talents do you have? What, what, how can we as a church, how can you as an individual member of the church, think outside of the box, beyond the traditional, beyond the regular routine of the weekly employment of the standard gifts? You know, when you go to the Old Testament scriptures, you also have spiritual gifts. We think of spiritual gifts as a new thing, right? And certainly Ephesians, I think it's chapter 4, mentions how that the gifts were bestowed upon the church when Christ ascended after his victory on the cross. That as he was coronated in heaven, that at that moment the Spirit poured out the gifts on the church. This is all true, but did you know that there are the equivalent of spiritual gifts in the Old Testament? Because a group of slaves were taken out of Egypt... They were destined to become the people of God. To them, God entrusted a message, the gospel message. He brought them to Mount Sinai. He gave them the Ten Commandments and their rites and passages of worship that, that, that displayed and that prefigured the coming of the Messiah. He set them up as a nation that would be uniquely positioned to bring the gospel to the world. In fact, in those days, he even put them right at the center of the trade routes in the Middle East in a country we today know as Israel. And there, that nation would be the light of the world as people from all over the various parts, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and the Far East, North Africa, would all converge and come through the Middle East there, right through Israel's territory. They couldn't go, go straight across because it was desert. They had to go through the Fertile Crescent, which meant they had to come through Jerusalem, go through Israel. And God positioned them there. This group of people that was given the gospel to take to the world, you know what God did? One of the first things he did when he brought them to Mount Sinai, apart from, from revealing himself, he says, here's what I need. I need you to build me a sanctuary. The sanctuary is going to be the place where I deal with sin. The sanctuary is going to be the very, the very illustration of the whole gospel. The sanctuary is going to be the place where I have a representation of my divine presence in the most holy place. The sanctuary is going to be the place where atonement is made. Reconciliation is accomplished between God and mankind. But I need you, this bunch of slaves used to making bricks and building pyramids and hauling stray, straw and doing all sorts of manual labor. I need you to build me a sanctuary. But God, how are we going to do that? We don't know what to do. I'll give you the pattern. I'll give you the pattern. Yes, Lord, but, but, but we can't exactly go to Target or to Kmart and buy the products that we need for this here, this here sanctuary. No, 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 you're going to build it from scratch. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You, you, all that gold and silver you pillaged from Egypt, you're going to bring that. We're going to melt that down. You're going to make it as an offering to me. Then I'm going to take you, this group of people, and I'm going to give you spiritual gifts to take all of that and embroider it and to create a masterpiece of artistic beauty called the sanctuary. He gave them the detailed plans, and then when you read the Old Testament account, the spiritual gifts that he bestowed upon his Old Testament church were the gifts of creativity, the gifts to sculpture, to shape out of metal, the gifts to embroider linen, the gifts to paint and to decorate, to create a sanctuary 
for the very presence of God. So I end on this note. If you are creative, and we all are in some way, shape, or fashion, if you are creative, let me ask you, how can you use that creativity for God? Because it's not just the preachers and the teachers who have spiritual gifts. It's the creators. It's the designers. It's the sketchers. It's the painters. It's the sculptors. All of these are creative gifts. It is the video editors. It is the ability to tell a story in pictorial form. It's the ability to capture mu mood through music. All of these things are gifts of creativity for the kingdom of God. So I leave you with this question. What creative talents have you got? Are you willing to leverage? How are you willing to think outside of the box beyond the traditional ministries of the church on a week-to-week -week basis to proclaim the everlasting gospel to every kindred, nation, tribe, tongue, and people at this time in Earth's history? Amen.